distinguished between the holy and the unholy. They've made, they have not made known the difference between the clean and the unclean. Does God want us to explain what is holy and what is not holy? What is clean and what is not clean? What is sin and what is not sin? They have a responsibility. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Now is there a danger that living in the last days that because you want to attract more people to the church that you might say, well, you know, the easier we make it, the more will come. I mean, I've learned a little bit about marketing with amazing facts. You know, we have books that we sell and we have programs that we encourage people to participate in and there's a science to marketing. You want to make something as attractive as possible to people. Well, what do you think attracts people? What do you think marketers use in the world today? They appeal to the carnal nature. They say, you take this product, you're going to live longer, you're going to have more money, you're going to be happier, you're going to be more popular. They appeal basically to the carnal side. Does the Bible tell us that's how we're to market Christianity? You're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy, you're going to be wise. Come to Jesus. Prosperity preaching. You ever heard about that? What will Jesus do for you? Is that what the message of salvation is? Now there are things that Jesus does for us. Praise God. There's a lot of good news. There's a lot of blessings that come. But Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself daily. We don't hear that very often. But the real key to happiness, Jesus said, is don't put yourself first, put God first, put others first. But you know, it's so much of it is about me. It's about I. And a lot of people are hearing a deluded gospel. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Him. We live for the glory of God. We exist for the glory of God. Even your salvation is for His glory, it's not for ours. And so things are being deluded. Is it important for us to hear the Word? Yes, we come to church to hear the Word. How much of the week is that? Well, it depends on who's preaching. But, uh, well, well, you know, let's just say it's not one-seventh of the week because I know you're not hearing it all day long. And it might be 4% uh, of your week sitting down hearing the Word of God. It's actually less than that. But what's the most important thing? Being hearers of the word or doers? It's like the other 95%. And so being a Christian isn't that 5% during the week or that 2% during the week. We're hearing the word. We're fellowshipping together, as important as that is. It's in what do we do with it the other 95% of the time? That's what means if you're really a Christian. Are we hearers of the word only or doers of the word? Luke 6, 46. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Should we call ourselves Christians if we're not willing to do His will? John 13, 17. He said, you know these things. Blessed are you. I want you to be blessed, friends. Blessed are you if you do them. How important is it with the Lord that we're not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word? Matthew 12, 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. He wants us to be doing His will. Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, He said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Same thing, doing it. Revelation, I read this during Sabbath school today, Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those that do His commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter through the gates of the city. See, part of the gospel we're not hearing today is that he wants us to be a people who really obey Him. Are we saved by obedience? No, they, if you teach you're saved by obedience, that's legalism. But is obedience legalism? No. He wants us to obey Him because we love Him. He said it's not everyone that just says, Lord, Lord. 1 John 2, 3. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 3 John, uh, 3 John 1, 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who practices evil has not seen God. 
And so the Lord is wanting us to be doers of his word. So what does a diluted gospel look like? Yeah, I've been talking about these analogies and metaphors. I'll tell you, if I was to sum it up, I'd say when people are encouraged to have enough faith to believe that God will forgive them, but not enough to believe that he will keep them from temptation. That's a diluted gospel. It's not just justification. The Bible tells us very plainly that part of the science of salvation is sanctification. You come to the Lord just as you are without one plea. Everybody can come to Jesus just as they are. Right? That's good news. But he loves you too much to leave you just as you are. Do you really want to be just as you are? Or then does he transform you and sanctify you and you become a new creature? He's able to keep you from falling. Jude 1 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, from falling, and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I want to have a life where I don't stumble all the time. 2 Timothy 4.18 And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. So it's not just that we're justified when we come to Jesus. We're preserved. We're kept by his grace. The same way that Jesus resisted temptation through the power of the word, we can. Secondly, another example of a deluded gospel is when people are taught that God accepts them the way they are, but they don't believe that he transforms them. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. In the Great Commission, he says, Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. So first they come, all right, and they're, they're taught. And it says they're continued to be taught to observe all things that I have commanded them. You know, you hear so little of that today. It seems like the emphasis today, you know, the church kind of goes through cycles, the history of the church goes through cycles where they, they kind of get out there, if you want to use the word liberal or conservative or if you want to use the word presumptuous and legalistic, it, it, you know, there's different ways you could categorize this, but they get so burnt out on the, the behavior and the obedience and the legalism that they gravitate towards grace, but it doesn't stop there. It's like trying to stop a battleship. It just keeps on moving. The pendulum then goes way over here where then they become so grace-oriented that they start living just like the world. You can't see a difference anymore. That's where I think we are now. We're in that day where you, there's, if you don't tell a person that you're a Christian, so, so few people really live it in their lives consistently that the world wouldn't ever know that there's a difference. We ought to be lights on a hill that people say, wow, their light is, light is shining. Their life is clearly, distinctly different. They're not just like everybody else. What's different about you? I believe in Jesus. I love the Lord. He saved me. He's changed my life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Doesn't stop there. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. But you know, there's that temptation. And I amazing facts. We're, we're right in there with everyone else. We've made this mistake before. There is a temptation that every church, you too, and pastor faces. How do we measure success? How do you measure a church's success? Seventh-day Adventist church, Baptist church, Mormon church, you know what they do? They say, how is it growing? Are there more people? Does it look like it's prospering? Very rarely do you say, we're going to measure the success of this church by how godly the people are. What they do is they say, is it spreading? Is it growing? Are people coming? Are they baptizing? Are they having converts? And they figure then it's growing. So if we know that we can have more converts by not making it so difficult to be a member, well, there's a temptation to say, well, you know, if we kind of just lower the fence a little bit, they can jump over. And so basically, we dumb it down a little bit. We dilute it a little bit. So the medicine's not so strong. And it makes it, you know, you kind of open the gate a little. Jesus said it's a straight and narrow gate. Open it a little wider, a little wider, a little wider. You know, they're saying that, um, oh, I don't know if I dare say this, in the design of the 
automobiles in America and the planes, they're having to redesign the 